We're in John's Gospel, chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 10 through 18. And so I'll begin reading at verse 10. I'll read to verse 13. We'll get into our study. John chapter 1, verses 10 through 13. He was in the world. The world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And so, as we're going through John, let me remind you of a couple of things as I introduce this portion of Scripture. The Apostle John has just introduced to us John the Baptist. And remember how he had introduced John to us in contrast to Jesus Christ. And, and as he was doing so, he had made a declaration. You see it in verse 9, that Jesus is the true light. So the Apostle John wanted to make it clear that John the Baptist was not the light. John the Baptist, in other words, is not Messiah. He's the forerunner of Messiah. John had been sent to bear witness, he said in verses 7 and 8, to bear witness of that light, that true light, Jesus Christ, which is what Scripture says concerning John. In, in Mark chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, uh, it speaks of him in this way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight, John came baptizing in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. So he is the one who is crying in the wilderness, and he was crying out, prepare the way of the Lord. And so he's not Messiah. He is the forerunner of Messiah. And so from the beginning, the apostle John has made it very clear that Jesus is the true light. He is the one who illuminates our sin-darkened minds and souls. That's what he speaks about in verse 9. When he says, that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. Notice how he says, which gives light to every man who comes into the world. Now, just I didn't touch on this last time. I'll pick up on it for just a moment right now. Some believe that when he's speaking of this light, verse 9, the true light, uh, that this light is within every person, that they're actually born with it. That's been called general illumination. It's what is also referred to as our conscience. And when you think about that, and you look at Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, uh, you can see why some would say that. Because in Romans 1, 18 through 20, Paul the apostle said this. He said, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. He's saying that through conscience, mankind stands guilty before God, because your conscience can accuse you, and excuse you. And so your conscience is a barometer. It's a moral barometer, if you will. It can't save you. It does inform you. But that's something that's within all of us. Every culture has a sense of what is right and what is wrong. So Paul would be saying in Romans that people are without excuse because they know that they don't always live up to the moral codes or the things that are best. And that would be something that some theologians would say speaks of this light that gives light to every man coming into the world. They would say that you were born with the capacity of knowing what was right and wrong. You have that ability to do so, that that's innate. And so he would be saying that this light is something that gives to us the ability to know when we're wrong and thus ought to accuse us and ought to help us to understand what we're, that we're wrong, but it's not sufficient to save us. Salvation requires the work of the Holy Spirit, and God's Word instructs us, and when God's Word and the Holy Spirit are working together, there's a conviction in our hearts, and then God's Word instructs us on our way of salvation, how to come out of that and have 
a life with him. You see, God saves any and all who come to him through Jesus Christ, and it requires us agreeing with him that he's right. It, it requires that we repent from our sin, and it requires that we turn to him in faith. And so if that's what he's basically, it seems that he's been laying a foundation for. And so he spoke of Jesus, who is the word of God. He speaks of John, who came before Jesus. He's speaking of that light within man that actually should awaken us to our need for salvation. And then he moves on into verse 10, and he's speaking of this true light. And it's how, this is how he says it in verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world didn't know him. He was in the world, the world was made through him, but the world didn't know him. The created world, in other words, generally ignored the coming of Jesus Christ. God was with man, but man didn't want him. Man chose to reject him. Now, that's something that the prophets spoke about. One prophet in particular, Isaiah, said it like this in Isaiah 53, 1 through 3. He said, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He's despised, rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised. We did not esteem him. And when you think of Jesus, when he had been beaten in the way that he was, his face was, was beaten to a pulp. His beard had been pulled out of his face. He had a crown of thorns. And that's what Isaiah is referring to. They looked at him, but they didn't want him. He had no form. He had no comeliness. He is despised. He was rejected. And that's what John is referring to when he says in verse 10, he was in the world. The world was made through him. The world did not know him. The world didn't want Jesus Christ, and by the way, the world still doesn't want Jesus Christ. In verse 10, as it says, the world was made through him. All things, both seen and unseen, are created through Jesus Christ. In Hebrews 11, verse 3, it says, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Now, this truth is encapsulated in one of the early creeds, one of the faith statements of the church. There was a council back in 325. It's called the Council of Nicaea. And the Council of Nicaea authored what is called the Nicene Creed, which in part says, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. And so the church uh, is, has always understood that Jesus is the one who made the world. He made everything. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, Paul said, for, for us there's one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things uh, were created and through whom we live. And so, though all things were created through him, the world didn't know him. Now, when it speaks of the world not knowing him, he was in the world, the world was made through him, the world did not know him. The word know speaks of intimacy. The word know is they didn't want a relationship with him. They rejected this. To have a knowledge of God is an intimacy. It's not an intellectual thing alone. There are many who believe that, that uh, just believing in your mind that there is a God is sufficient. But what God desires is fellowship with us an intimacy with us. You know, I can say that I know somebody because I've seen them playing baseball. I can say I know a particular baseball player. Oh, yeah, I know so-and-so. Oh, but that, that simply means I know of that person. But there's a difference between saying I know of someone and I know someone personally. And what God wants is not us just to know of him, but he wants us to know him. And the world didn't want to know him. The world didn't want to have intimacy with God. They rejected him. They had no desire for him. They didn't want that kind of fellowship. It's like what Isaiah in chapter 1 says in verses 2 and 3, where he says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. The Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they've rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, the donkey its master's crib, but Israel doesn't know my people do not consider. A 
donkey and an ox know their owner. Where they eat. But he says, my people don't know me. And you can almost hear the tear in the voice of the Lord as he speaks concerning Israel. Well, that's how they were when Jesus came. He came to his own. They didn't want him. The world, he says in verse 10, didn't know him. Notice verse 11, he came to his own. His own did not receive him. Now that word own there, he came to his own in verse 11, and his own did not receive him. Those are actually two different ways of speaking. When it says he came to his own, it's speaking of his own place. He came to his nation. He came to his own place, and his own people did not receive him. He came to Israel, and the Jewish people rejected him, is what he's saying. The word of God came in a special way to the people of Israel, but the people of Israel rejected him. It's like Mark 6, verses 4 through 6, where Jesus said, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, in his own house. He could do no mighty work there except that he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. He marveled because of their unbelief. He went about the villages in a circuit teaching, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. They rejected him. Now, this nation that is rejecting him in verse 11, this nation had so many advantages. Paul speaks about that in Romans 9, verses 4 and 5, when he's speaking of the nation, says, to whom pertain adoption, the glory, speaking of the Shekinah glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises of whom are the fathers and from whom According to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, the eternally blessed God. Amen. This nation had so many advantages, but they rejected him, and they refused to believe him. Hebrews 4, 2 says, Indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. You see, it's easy to listen to a Bible study, but you need to mix the words with faith in order that your life will be transformed. Again, it's not simply putting um, notes down on a piece of paper. It's when the word of God is engraved in our hearts. And so they rejected him. He came to his own. His own didn't receive him. They didn't welcome him. But, verse 12, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Notice, as many as received him, when he says as many, that would refer both to Jew as well as Gentile. You see, the Jews were descendants physically of Abraham. And because they were physical descendants of Abraham, they thought they were automatically saved. They would speak of themselves as children of Abraham. But when John was baptized, and it's recorded in Matthew 3, 7 through 9, he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism. And he said to them, <laughs> this is his welcoming statement. Think of this next time we have a baptism. He said, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Don't say that you have some kind of connection with God because you're a descendant physically of Abraham. Because the reality is, is Abraham is a man who is marked by his faith. Abraham believed God, the scripture says, and it was counted unto him as righteousness. It wasn't just that Abraham um, had some kind of, quote-unquote, knowledge of God. He had faith in God. He believed God. And it wasn't all the works that he did that saved him. It was his faith in God that saved him. And we become children of God, even as Abraham was, because we have faith in God. You see, to be saved was always an exercise of faith. Now Jesus is amongst them. They're to receive him as Messiah. They need to welcome him. They need to acknowledge him. They need by faith to appropriate him. And they need to trust him. And by trusting, they're going to become children of God. It's not a natural, but a supernatural birth that they need. And that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. When I got saved, and this may be offensive, forgive me, but it's, it's part of my testimony. I don't know how to say it in a way that has a kindness to it. It's just a fact. And I'll say it like this. When I got saved, I hadn't been in church 
for years. The only time I'd ever go to a church was for uh, uh, either a baptism or a wedding. And that was infrequently at best. I never went to church. I stopped going to church when I was about 13. And now I'm 20. I haven't been in church for seven years. So I got saved in December, and now it's the first of the year. It's, it's January. And I got a letter that said, this is a letter from your church. And it's, it's the time of the year for you to give your gift to your church. They wanted me to send them some money. But they said, this is, and then they had a little envelope that said, my gift to my church. Now, I'm a brand new Christian. I haven't learned tact yet. Apparently, I still haven't because I'm sharing this story with you. <laughs> but I'm a brand new believer, brand new. You know, five, five years, to some people, that's lightweight. But I was 15 to 20. I was abusing drugs, alcohol, you know, stealing. I was, I was living a crazy life and, and going down. You know, the last month before I got saved, I dropped, I've said this to you before, between 30 and 40 pounds because I stopped eating. I was, in, and I was, I was not a big person. I, I only weighed in my mid-170s at that time. I went down to about 135, 140 pounds because I wasn't eating. Uh, I wish I could lose weight that fast now, but at that time, I just wasn't eating because I was drinking and smoking dope, and, and that's what I was doing. So I stopped eating. Um, and dropped weight. And so when I, when I went to hear the gospel and I got saved, I was radically saved. It wasn't one of those, well, you know, I'll give Jesus a try kinds of things. There are people today who do that. Well, let's give God a chance, as if God's on trial. God's not on trial. But we, we, we'll give you a try. We'll see whether it works or not. If it doesn't work, I can always go back. That's not salvation. That's not seeking God. That's not being broken. That, that's that, that's That's... That's just not real. That's not real. I had a real salvation experience. I saw myself for what I was, a, a sinner. I saw myself for where I was. I was lost. And I saw myself for, for, for being a hopeless person. I had nothing, no love, no joy, nothing. I saw that. And, and when I heard the gospel, a radical transformation took place in my life. Got away from the drugs, got away from the alcohol, got away from the life and started talking to people about Christ, brought my father to faith, brought my mother to faith, brought my sister to faith. I mean, I was radically transformed. And now I'm getting a letter. Your church wants money. And I wrote them. And I said, dear church. I said, it's interesting, it's interesting that you wrote me a letter saying, my church wants my money. I said, when in fact, I haven't been in my church for seven years. And nobody noticed. Nobody has noticed that I have not been there. And yet you are sending me a letter asking me for money for my church when you haven't missed me one day that I've been gone. I said, but let me tell you something. I, I said, instead of giving a, a money gift to you, I want to give you something you never gave to me. I want to give you the gospel. I want to tell you that Jesus Christ died on the cross for sinners. I want to tell you that he was buried. And the third day he rose from the dead. I want to tell you that I have been saved by Jesus Christ, by the grace of God, through faith in him. I'm giving you something you never gave me. I'm giving you the gospel, and I'm telling you, you need to repent and come to faith in Jesus Christ. I was 20 years old. I haven't, I haven't changed since then. That's a fact. That's a fact. You see, we, we, it, it, it isn't that we go to church. It isn't even that we go midweek as we are now. Thank God that you're here, and I bless the Lord. But it's not that. It's that we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. As to many, as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become sons of God, even unto those who believe on his name. It isn't simply acknowledging the reality of a Jesus, but you receive him, you welcome him by faith, and that's how you become a child of God, by trusting in him 
It's a supernatural birth. Galatians 3.26 says you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 17 and 18, Paul writes, Therefore come out from among them, be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean. I will receive you. I will be a father to you. You shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Notice how he says in verse 12, To them he gave the right. That right, the word right, the power, that right means the honor, the privilege to become children of God. Somebody said, those who accept Jesus Christ as he is offered to them in the gospel have, through his blood, a right to sonship. And those who are engrafted in the heavenly family have the highest honor and dignity to which it is possible for a human soul to arrive. The sinner who was an heir to all God's curses has through the sacrifice of Jesus a claim on the mercy of the Most High. He gave you the right, the privilege to become his children, to receive his mercy. Notice verse 13, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. God's children do not owe their sonship, or daughtership for that matter, to physical descent or carnal desire or a decision of the will. We become his children because he receives us as his children when he draws us to himself. John 6, says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. The Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Holy Spirit, through the gospel, tells us the way of salvation, drawing us to a relationship with him. It wasn't something that we did on our own. It was something he did on our behalf. And we have responded by faith to accept that which has been offered. So the gospel explains to me how I can be saved. The Holy Spirit convicts me of my sin. And I, by faith, receive that which has been offered to me. We are born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, but of God. He moves on in verse 14, and he says, And the word became flesh, dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now remember in verse 1 how he had said, In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was was God. He had also said in verse 4, in him was life, the life was the light of men. And he had said in verse 7, this man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. So Jesus Christ is the word. And through him, through John's preaching of repentance, we come to faith in him. So when he says in verse 14, the word became flesh, he's hearkening back to verse 1 when it speaks of the word being with God, and notice again, the word was God. There is a particular organization that has added uh, a. They have said he is a God. That is not in the original Greek whatsoever. They're trying to make Jesus into a creation of God. John never said that Jesus was the first creation of God. That's actually an ancient heresy that has been dealt with and debated early in the history of the church. No, he is God, and it says he is the word of God, and then he says this word in verse 14 became flesh. Speaking of the incarnation, and dwelt among us, we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So John says the word became flesh. John is saying God took upon himself human nature. So the point he's making is there's a God, and the God that we worship is personal. He's loving, and he's caring. Why is this important enough for John to be moved to communicate this to his readers? Because a loving, personal God who would dwell with men was unheard of at that time. And I'm going to give you a little bit. It's a Bible study. I'll give you a little Bible teaching here of why that's important. And I have to do so by referring to an ancient uh, heresy, an ancient teaching. And I'll just read my notes. That way I make sure that I'm clear in this. There were Greek philosophers during that day. Then John was writing this, this gospel. And again, every gospel has a reason for 
being written. You need to remember that. You know, Matthew was written in order that the Jews would understand that their Messiah had come. That's why when you read the Gospel of Matthew, you see him saying this was that which was written of by the prophets. Because Matthew was written as an apologetic to Jews. So his Jewish readers, when they would, when they would uh, read Matthew, they would see the scripture that would give to them insight into the fact that Jesus Christ was Jewish and he fulfilled Jewish scriptures. When you, when you look into Mark, Mark uses a word quite often, servant. He's, and he used the word servant concerning Jesus Christ and how Jesus Christ was a servant because he was writing to especially Roman Gentiles. And in Rome, the, uh, the greatest person in the uh, Roman Empire, the greatest person most respected was, was really the servant of the state. When he was writing, when Luke was writing to the Greeks, he was writing, and that's who he was writing to. He was writing to the Greeks, and he would use terminology to help the Greeks to understand who Jesus Christ was. And that's why very often in the Gospel of Luke, he speaks of Jesus as the Son of Man, because he was trying to reach the mind of the Greek through using terminology they understood. When John was writing, John was writing to the Greeks who had been influenced by the Gnostics, by a philosophy that was beginning to permeate at that time and was an attack against the Christian faith. And so there were Greek docetic, they were called docetics, Greek docetic philosophers. And they had rejected the thought that there could be a God who is spirit who could take upon himself human nature. They rejected the assertion that God took upon himself human flesh. They thought that Jesus was only a man and that he had a portion of what they called the Messiah or the Christ spirit upon him. So one of the greatest opponents of the gospel when the gospel was written were the Gnostics. The word Gnostic is a Greek word that speaks of knowledge, gnosis. So they were the ones who believed that they had secret knowledge. They were called the Gnostics. They were docetics who believed that spirit would not inhabit flesh because spirit and flesh were at war. And so they believed the material body was sinful. They taught that God could not dwell in such a body. Consequently, the Gnostic could not believe in the incarnation. Some believe that Jesus only appeared to possess a physical body. These have come to be called docetists or uh, docetics because the Greek word dokein means to seem. Others said that the divine Christ came upon the human Jesus at his baptism. And they pointed to Matthew 3.16 when the spirit descended but that he left, the spirit left him before his death. You see in Matthew 27, where Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that's what the docetics believed, that there was no way that God would take upon himself human flesh. The, the Gnostics did not believe that sin was a problem within man. For the Gnostic, a man was lost because he was imprisoned in a material body. His only hope was that through knowledge, was through knowledge. So the way he could be delivered from his prison was to obtain secret knowledge. And the Gnostics taught the problem that humanity has is not sin, but ignorance. And so that was at that time. But God's answer to the Gnostic was simple. Our problem isn't ignorance. Our problem is sin. And the solution is confession of sin repentance, turning away from it, and receiving forgiveness. Now, many today are uncomfortable with the concept of a personal God. Part of the reason for this discomfort is it requires accountability. When you believe there's a personal God, then you have become accountable to this God. And it's spiritual blindness that John intends to remedy through the gospel. And he wants to point out to us that God is personal, that God took upon himself human nature, and God lived amongst men. Notice how he says in verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. That word dwelt is the word tabernacle. He tabernacled amongst us. Colossians 1.15, we'll be looking at this this Sunday. Speaking of Jesus, he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And he goes on in Colossians 2 verse 9 to say, in him, in Jesus dwells all the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. So John intends us to associate the tabernacle of the Old Testament with Jesus. Now, when you read your Old Testament, you remember there's the tabernacle that ultimately became the temple. 
Well, the tabernacle was a place of worship. It was where God said he would meet with his people. In Exodus 25, 8, God had said, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And so when it says we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, he's saying that this word is, is speaking of the Shekinah. It points to the manifestation of God in the flesh. And God has dwelt in the tabernacle. In the Old Testament, God dwelt in the tabernacle and the priest saw his glory. When Jesus dwelt amongst men, his glory was manifested in his words and his actions. And Jesus is revealed here as being the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God tabernacled amongst men. People had an opportunity to see him. They saw him in the flesh. They were able to, 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 to speak to him, to, to eat meals with him, to lie down in a campsite next to him. John was able to put his head on, on, on the chest of Jesus and to, to actually hear the heartbeat of God. Can you imagine that? To hear the heartbeat of God. He would put his head on his chest. And in doing so, he was hearing God's own heart. Amazing thought. We saw him. After Jesus had died, was buried, was resurrected, he appeared to his disciples. John wasn't around at the first time. And, uh, and the men said, we saw Jesus, or rather Thomas. They said, we saw Jesus. And Thomas said, no, and let's put my hands in his wounds, in his side. The marks that he received, I will not, I cannot believe. And so that, a few days later, Jesus appears to Thomas and, and speaks to him. We all know the story. We'll get there. It's in chapter 20. It'll be two years, but we will make it. And he says, Thomas, he said, put your hand in my wounds. Put your hand in my side. You can touch my wounds. You see, he wasn't a ghost. He was physically resurrected in a glorif not a glorified, but in a spiritual body. And Thomas didn't want to reach over and touch this physical body of Christ. He simply said, my Lord and my God. You remember the story. My Lord and my God. Thomas, you believe because you see? Blessed is one who never sees and yet believes. And that's us. Thomas had said, unless I touch him, unless I feel, I will not believe. Jesus said, no, blessed is the one who never sees and yet believes. And that's you because you walk by faith and not by sight. But John is saying here, he tabernacled amongst us. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth. We saw him. We lived next to him. We saw God in the flesh. We are eyewitnesses to this. And this is a God filled with grace, God filled with truth, grace and truth being fully revealed in Jesus. The grace spoke of causes joy. The grace is, is, is goodwill, it's kindness, it's undeserved favor. Because Jesus was kind, he's merciful, he's gracious. Gracious in the way that he did good to all. He, he, he was seeking man's welfare through great sacrifice and love. God revealed and provided his grace in Jesus, especially in his death for us. He was filled with truth, and it's the truth that sets sinners free. Somebody said he was not like the false prophets and false messiahs who were entirely imposters. He was truth itself. In 1 John 1, 5, this is the message which we've heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him is no darkness at all. And he goes on, and he says in verse 15, John bore witness of him, cried out, saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. He ranks higher than me because he predates me, though my ministry may predate his. You see, John was physically born before Jesus, but he didn't exist before Jesus. John had a starting point, and Jesus does not. In Psalm 90, verse 2, before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. So Jesus had no beginning, and John did, and that's why John bore witness of him, 
and said, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me. He was before me. Verse 16, and of his fullness we have all received in grace for grace of his fullness. Fullness, the abundance of his grace, the abundance of his mercy by which he made atonement for sin. Jesus is the fountain of God's abundant grace, blessings, and mercy. In Ephesians 1, 7, it says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. You ever think about how much God has forgiven you? You ever think about that? I hope you do. I do. I think about it. I do. I do. The abundance of his grace. The super overflow of grace to me. His mercy. Do you ever think of his mercy? If God didn't give us his mercy, indeed, we'd all perish instantly. But he has shown us mercy, and I'm so grateful. The scripture says that his mercy is new every morning because I pretty much use up all his mercy in the, that, the first day, and then the next day I need more. His mercy is renewed to me daily and to you too. And we partook of his grace. We received of his mercy because he loves us. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. If there's anything I believe yet that your flesh and the devil conspire to make you believe is that there may be a God, but he doesn't love you. That's just, that's just not true. God loves us. Do we deserve it? No. Do I deserve the love of God? No, of course not. Do I, do I deserve him sending his son Jesus to die on a cross for me? No. Do I even... Do I even conceive of what an incredible thing that is? No, I, I, I've been walking with the Lord a long time, and I have still yet to understand the depth of what it means that God loved the world so much that he gave his son. I still haven't gotten hold of that yet after all of these years because its depth is deeper than anything that I can conceive. That God, who knows this, you know, like it says, he knew the splendors of heaven knowing that his destiny was a lonely hill called Golgotha, where he laid down his life for me, if that isn't love. And it is love. That God loved you and me so much that he gave his son. We have a new granddaughter, my Olivia. Olivia's already got a personality. She's demanding. So my prayers have been answered. For her parents. May she put you through what you have put us through. In Jesus' name, amen. I believe it and I receive it. And so with that, she was with us. Uh, her mommy and daddy brought her to the couple's retreat this last week. Yeah. And uh, she's demanding I mean, she, she, when she's nursing, if, if she doesn't get enough, she lets you know. And with an angry little baby growl. And she gets mad. And when she's being changed, she fights. She kicks her father. She doesn't like being changed. It's just a joy to see this. And so <laughs> she was born a month early, a month early. Tiny little thing. You know, and we prayed daily, Father, you know, may this baby survive. And, you know, because, you know, it's still a, a premature baby you, you, you're concerned for. You're concerned for any newborn, but I was very concerned for this little one. And, and so she was with us just this last week, and, and Marie and I, Grandma and I, um, spent time with her on Saturday afternoon. We had the baby in our room, and her parents had to come too, uh, but <laughs> we had the baby with us and, you know, holding her and just looking at her. And any parent or grandparent knows what I'm trying to say. It's just there's just something there. There's something there. Grandparent, wouldn't it have been great to just skip the children and go great, right to grandchildren? Can I get an amen? Yes. Yeah, it's just amazing, you know. They get weird and you just hand them to the parents. See you later, you know, it's just different. 
And so this, this tiny little thing here, this tiny little thing, such a personality already. She stares at you. She'll look in your face like, who are you? She, she does that, you know, and, and you're just drawn irresistibly, you know, as a grandfather and grandmama. Just want to just want to bite her, you know, just <laughs> just love that baby. Well, Mary had a baby, too. And that baby was Jesus. And Mary loved that baby, too. She she cared for him. She fed him. She she changed him. She played with him. She had something to do, a great deal to do with him learning to walk, I'm sure, to talk. She watched him grow up. She saw him play. When he fell and hurt himself, I'm sure that she as a mother would pick him up, sometimes maybe even cry. Scripture doesn't say that Jesus fell and hurt himself. Most children do. Perhaps he did. And she watched this baby, and in the back of her mind, she was dwelling on the reality that she knew this was the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. She knew that, and she raised him, and she brought him to adulthood, and he's 30, and he's now at Cana, and he's at a wedding, and we'll see this when we get to chapter 2 in a month. And um, she says they have no wine. And he says to her, woman, what has that got to do with me? My hour has not yet come. She knows that there's an hour for her son. She says they have a need. Jesus meets the need, performs his first miracle. And she knows now the clock is ticking. It's ticking all through the Gospel of John. The clock is ticking. And then one day, and Jesus is in a garden, he has celebrated Passover. He's taken his disciples with him to the Garden of Gethsemane. One of them had left early. The people thought that he perhaps had something to buy for provisions for the Passover. They didn't know that Judas had left to betray him. And they go to that garden. And they're in that garden when these soldiers with torches and lanterns and officers come and by force they want to take Jesus. Jesus stands in opposition to them, but if you come for, come for Jesus, I am he. They fall to the ground. I said unto you, I am he. What do you want? They take him. Peter tries to defend, but just him and his little sword, there's nothing he can do. Put away your sword, Jesus tells him. And he take, he's taken. He stands before two individuals, Pilate being one. He's beaten disfigured crown of thorns placed on his head his face is bruised up his beard is pulled out there's no doubt that there's blood in his face his back has been ripped open he carries his cross and he ends up in a place called Golgotha and there is John marrying a couple of the other faithful women and they watch him as he gives his last words from that cross. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Woman, behold your son. Son, behold, behold your mother. He begins to speak and share. We'll look at those things as we get there. And finally, he says, it is finished. And he puts his head down, breathes his last. He dies on a cross. And his mother's there watching this. They take his body down. They put it in a borrowed tomb. Did you deserve that? I didn't. I didn't. He took my place. He took my place. And if that doesn't make me love him, what will? Have I forgotten? Is it, it is easy to forget? To think, well, of course he did that. He's God. He can do anything. No, he was man. And he took upon himself the sin of the world. He felt God's frown for the first time. When he said, Father, why have you, why have you forsaken me? 
He felt what you and I feel. Abandoned. Because sin makes separation. Truly the God that we worship is a God of love. Truly he is. A God who cares. A God who left his throne and took his place on a cross. A God who was placed in a manger. A God who was placed on a cross. A God who was placed in a borrowed tomb. That's our God. A God who conquered the grave and conquered sin. A God who is alive. A God who ever lives to make intercession for us. A God who is coming again for us. And that's our Jesus. And that's what he has done for us. And so naturally, God's grace, God's grace has been abundant towards us. And we have seen it in Jesus he says in verse 17, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son who's in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. The law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus. The law revealed sin, resulted in judgment unless perfectly obeyed. So this presents them with the understanding that the law actually pointed to Jesus Christ. That's what Paul said in Galatians 3 when he said in verses 24 through 26, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. The law revealed sin, brought judgment, but Jesus gives us grace. He goes on in verse 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father has declared him. Jesus is, the, is in the closest possible relationship to the father. Though Moses had a tremendous ministry, Moses cannot compare to Jesus who is the son of God. So when he says no man has seen God at any time, he's referring to God in his essential being. No one has seen God in his complete glory. We saw him as he was incarnated, but no one has seen him in his complete glory. Remember in the Old Testament book of Exodus, Moses was speaking to the Lord in Exodus 33, 18 through 20, and he said, please show me your glory. God said, I'll make all my goodness pass before you. I'll proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion but he said, you cannot see my face. No man shall see me and live. You are not capable of seeing me in my essential glory. So what did God do? He took upon himself human flesh. And we saw God in Christ, human form. We were able to behold him. And Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. When you see Jesus, you see God clothed in human flesh. And so no one has seen God in his essential glory. The only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father declared him. So we see God as we see Jesus. 